chance I'm a prisoner no more My shame was harassed If you fully do He canceled my debt And he called me his friend God, I love to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. that again. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know
There's bulletins that have been passed out. Um, or you can get one from one of the ushers. You can just want to ask that you would open your bulletin. You can see inside your bulletin there's a prayer request. If you have a prayer need, any special need right now in a time like this, fill it out. You'll see ushers in a black shirt. Just go ahead and hand it over to them. And then also we have some things that go on that we are still kind of doing. And, and you can 
check those announcements out as well. Um, looking forward in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting. Any married couples out here? Any married couples? Okay, we got one. Okay, there's my lovely wife back there. Married couples. I know it ain't easy. It ain't easy. So we're looking forward to be uh, gathering in, uh, in the month of September, be able to uh, go through a, a book and also to be able to be around each other to encourage one another. So look for that announcement that will be coming up pretty soon. With that, I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward this morning to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that you have allowed us to come together in this place. We thank you for the freedom that we have in you. And Lord, with this freedom, we want to worship you, Lord. Not just in our bad times, but even in our good times, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to be up this day and giving us this day. We ask that you would bless the tithes and the offerings. We ask that you would use them for your glory and honor. We ask it in Jesus' name.
only, there's only one that we bow to, and it is the Lord Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you and thank you for the privilege of being able to come and to worship you. To come be led in song, Lord, as we lift our voices to you this morning, and God, as we bow before your precious throne. We ask that you would be with us, Lord, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in us this morning that would draw us near to you, God. Help us to fall deeper in love with you. Lord, allow us to be more committed to you, finding ways that we might serve you all the days of our lives. We look forward, God, to what you have for us this morning in this time of worship, of reading your word of being those that are givers to the work of the kingdom and the ministry that you've called us to, and of the sweet fellowship that we have together here at Calvary Chapel, Roma Land. We ask that you would be glorified in it all, and we ask this in the precious name, the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, Amen huh? Turn around and say good morning to somebody near you. Give a wave, a handshake, an elbow, something. Allow them to know that you are blessed that they're here with you to be able to study this morning his word. Oh, the beauty of summer in Southern California, amen? Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's supposed to be over 100 today, so... We better get at it, huh, so that we can beat the heat. Would you turn in your Bibles to Daniel, please, as we continue uh, to study through the book of Daniel. What a great book to be studying through uh, with the signs of the times as they are and with all of those signs <clears throat> pointing towards the near coming of the Lord it is a great place for us to be studying through the book of Daniel at this time. So good morning to you and welcome back. If you're here for the first time, we are excited for you being here. Pray that you will be blessed in our time together. It's always good to be with the family of God here at Calvary Chapel, Roman Land, and worship together and, and to have these kinds of times. The last week when we were here, we were studying as uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was telling Daniel of his second dream, and we talked about making sure that we are ready to make a stand for the Lord. No matter who it is that's before us, that we're not to fear man, but to fear the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. In the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, and no one else that you and I are to bow to. And so, what a blessing to be able to have once again the Holy Spirit moving in the worship this morning. As we speak about the powerful name of Jesus and Him readying us, equipping us, and empowering us to be able to make those stands for Him. Chapter 4 and verse 18, if you will, we come back to King Nebuchadnezzar and him speaking to Daniel about the second dream uh, that he has and wanting its interpretation. He says, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Balthazar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. And so we remind you this morning of Nebuchadnezzar's acknowledgement of knowing that Daniel could speak the interpretation of the dream for only one reason, and that is that the spirit of the holy God was in him and that Daniel was not afraid to be able to speak the truth. We ended 
last week was the thought of us simply not acknowledging God, even as King Nebuchadnezzar did, but that God calls for us, commands all of us to be those that are fully submitted to him. King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges that it's the Holy Spirit of God that is moving in Daniel's life and that he can see, but he is not submitted to God, the Holy Spirit. Ephesians tells us that we're to be those that are ready to speak out the truth in love. I remind you of chapter 4, verse 15, where it says this, But speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And Daniel, being submitted to God Almighty, was not afraid to be able to give the interpretation like the other counselors were. Daniel's about to speak the truth once again to King Nebuchadnezzar. And remember that this king, that he is about to speak the truth of this dream into his life, is one who was known for brutality of anyone that would come against him. And yet, Daniel is bowing down, focused on serving only one, God Almighty, and not being afraid of what King Nebuchadnezzar could do. And so let's move on now as we move to verse 19 and start our study for this morning as we continue through chapter 4. It says this, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time. And his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Balthazar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. And Balthazar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. And so as we move into verse 19, we find it, very clear that there's a difference between Daniel and all the other counselors that King Nebuchadnezzar had. You see, I believe that it's very clear from the scripture that the other counselors could have given the interpretation, but because they recognized and understood what the interpretation of that dream was and the horror that was going to come upon the king, they were afraid to be able to speak the truth to the king. But Daniel is not afraid to speak it out. And yet, on the other hand, being such a God-fearing man that Daniel was, we see that the word says he was astonished for a time. Or if you will, again, as we look at this word, it is that he was astounded or amazed, even speechless for a time. As Daniel sees from the dream that was spoken to him, what kind of horror that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to go through to be humbled by the Lord. Remember that Daniel has a real relationship with King Nebuchadnezzar. He's a friend. And Daniel is stopped, if you will, for a moment in thinking about what the dream signifies and the horror that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to go through before he would be humbled by the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 8 says this, Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, and be courteous. And so the Word of God tells us that as Christians, as believers, as followers of the Lord Jesus, that we're to have the heart of God, as we see in Daniel here, as he ponders for a moment what it is that his friend King Nebuchadnezzar was going to have to go through. I believe that the Word of God wants us to pause for a moment and to make sure that we understand that God has called us to have those kinds of hearts. That we're to have hearts for those that have fallen. We're to have hearts for those that don't know the Lord. We're to have hearts for those and to remember that we ourselves are only one bad decision from being in the midst of them. 
and for us to have compassion on those that we see going through the difficulty of being separated from fellowship with the Holy God. God will do whatever it takes to rid us of the prideful sin that we see in King Nebuchadnezzar, and we watch as he does that this morning. And Daniel explains the second dream, verse 20, the trees that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose heights reached the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, and under which the beasts of the fields dwelt, and in whom branches of the birds of heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown to become strong, for your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And I'm sure as Daniel is giving this interpretation of the dream, the king Nebuchadnezzar thought, what a great start this dream was. But as Daniel says, it is you, O king, he knows the rest of the dream, and it becomes a nightmare for King Nebuchadnezzar. It's interesting from that time in Scripture that as we look at the pages, from time to time we see men that are put into this position, God-fearing holy men, that are having to make a stand like this in front of those that many would be fearful of. I'd like you to turn to 2 Samuel for a moment this morning. And to chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, you know also well the story of King David and his fall with Bathsheba. And in chapter 12, in verse 7, we find that David is visited by Nathan the prophet, another one that would have to make a bold stand for the Lord in front of a king who had all power on the earth. And the word says this in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel in verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Even as Daniel said, It is you, O king. So we have David in that same position. And as he stands before or Nathan in that same position as he stands before King David, and he tells King David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandments of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Oh, how the prophet Nathan had to stand on the truth as he stood before King David. And him standing on that truth would eventually allow for King David to be able to repent. And we know the rest of the story. Let me take you to just one more in the New Testament, if you would turn to Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew 14, as we see the word once again showing us that the man John the Baptist was one who would stand for the Lord and speak the truth in the midst of him knowing that he might be put to death for it. Matthew 14, and in verse 3, I pick up the story. It says, For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. So, men and women here this morning, let us recognize that standing for the truth is what God has called us to do. 
And sometimes that may be uncomfortable. Sometimes it may come with consequences of not being liked, not being received. And even someday it might come down to standing for the truth means losing your life. But if it is, so shall it be that the Lord will be standing there waiting for us and welcoming us into his rest. Daniel was not afraid to stand for the truth. And you and I need to ask ourselves this morning, have we been in positions where we have faltered? We've not stood on the truth of God's word and speaking out the truth to others because we were fearful of the reaction that we might get, that we might receive, rather than being those that understand the only reaction that we're looking really for is that of the Lord being glorified as we make those stands. While we move on, as Daniel deals with the bad news now, he says, And insomuch as king, the king saw the watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with the bands of iron and bronze, in tender grass of the field, let it be wet with dew of heaven, and let him gaze with the beasts of the field until seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. And, and as much as they have <coughs> gave the command to leave the stump and the roots in the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Can you imagine being King Nebuchadnezzar at this time and hearing Daniel speaking this out about himself and how it has come that Daniel is in this situation to be able to speak these words of truth uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar and then the king just sitting there and thinking, Daniel, it can't be that bad. Isn't there another interpretation that you might come up with from this dream. Daniel has just told the king that he would go insane, that he would be in a demented state for some seven years and would be acting like an animal as well as thinking like an animal. What an incredible word that Daniel has just brought to the man who was in charge, if you will, of the world at the time as it was known. Church, this is a real state of mind. Even today, there is a medical term for it known as zoanthropy, and it is recognized by the medical world. And in our study, as we look at it, we see that it was brought on by God himself. Daniel is interpreting the dream that God had given to be able to show King Nebuchadnezzar what was going to hap happen. But it was brought on for an implicit purpose, and we need to recognize that. The word tells us, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives to whoever he chooses. And so that's exactly what we will see play out as we continue uh, through the passage. Look at verse 27 as we see the gift of grace offered to King Nebuchadnezzar. The word says, Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. 
And so I love that God always gives that amazing grace before he brings judgment down upon anyone. Proverbs 3 and verse 34 says this, Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. And we see as God's grace is extended through Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar. Listen, King, you know that I come from Almighty God, that he is the one that has given me the power by the Holy Spirit to be able to interpret dreams. You have seen this in the past. I have been by your side as a part of your kingdom. And Daniel, looking seriously into the eyes of the king, I'm sure would simply be saying to the king, repent of your sins so that you might not have to go through all of this horror that has been described in the dream. Notice also that Daniel does not call him just simply to say words of repentance, but to show true signs of repentance by engaging in righteous ruling. If you will, he says, show mercy to the poor. Let there be an example or an outworking of the belief that you have. So it should be for all of us. Many people will say that they're Christians, but live like hell the rest of their life. We need to make sure that the life that we're living is an outpouring of what's taken place in our hearts as we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is that you and I are not only to say that we're Christians, but to live as Christians. Now, many of you know that um, this morning I, I want to say a special prayer for Noe. Uh, Noe has been with the ministry for several years now and he lost his papa just uh, yesterday. So we want to say a, a special prayer for him. A special prayer for my family. I appreciate the prayers that have gone up for my uncle Dick who passed away yesterday as well. And I wrote to his family that Uncle Dick didn't say a lot. He didn't talk all the time about Christ, but he lived the gospel. It is so important for us to be those that live the gospel, that understand that Christ has called us to come to him, that we might represent him, that we might be ambassadors for him. And Daniel is calling for King Nebuchadnezzar to come to that place of being fully submitted, not acknowledging, but being fully submitted to God Almighty. And this morning it is a good question for us to ask ourselves. Do those around us know that we are Christians by the life that we are living? Do we show true signs of repentance from the sins that we have been involved in? Many times people think that it's just a, a confession of I'm sorry. That is what the Lord is looking for. But it's much deeper than that. True signs of repentance means that there's a real heart change and a desire to move away from those areas that don't play, please the Lord. And so this morning, let us just see once again here in the scripture, God shouts out his grace and allowing for Nebuchadnezzar to know as Daniel is speaking to him that he simply needs to get before the Lord, repent of his sin and change Make that, if you will, you turn for Christ, and Christ would be gracious to him. Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Daniel, shouting out the grace of God, would call for me to shout out the grace of God as well this morning. It is simply by coming to a place 
of not only acknowledging your sin and confessing your sin, but moving away from it, changing the direction of your thoughts and the direction of your actions that the Lord is looking for. But God is going to say to King Nebuchadnezzar, if you continue in disobedience, then there are always consequences that follow. And look at the pride of Nebuchadnezzar in the next couple of verses. It says, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. So exactly as Daniel had proclaimed it was going to happen, it all happened. But look at what, it, uh, what the word says at the end of 12 months. So there was a gracious period. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is this not, or is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? The pride of King Nebuchadnezzar just strikes the heart, doesn't it? When we look at this word, it's easy to be able to pass judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember now that King Nebuchadnezzar is the one that is writing. It's the only place in the Old Testament where we have a pagan king writing in Aramaic that's recorded in the book of Daniel for us. He's recording what King Nebuchadnezzar wrote himself. And just like Daniel said, it would come to pass. And guys and gals, the arrogance of King Nebuchadnezzar at this time, looking at it after Daniel has spoken to him and what is going on and what is to happen, tells me that we all are able to relate to King Nebuchadnezzar, aren't we? Because the pride of King Nebuchadnezzar has been in all of our life. The Word of God tells us that all sin is rooted in pride and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none of us that haven't had to deal with pride in some capacity, in some form, and recognize, if you will, with me, that in all honesty, we have all been there at one time or another. But as we look at this word, the word says that God's grace was long-suffering. For 12 months, the Lord, after the warning had gone out, had not brought the circumstances, the consequences on Daniel or on King Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel had spoken of. And I think here's another lesson for us to make sure we understand. Don't let the amazing grace and long suffering of God have you thinking that if repentance is not near, that judgment will not eventually come. Because it has to come. Because our God is holy. And he deals with sin by bringing about consequences. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a gracious God we have, and how long-suffering is our God. What a beautiful story it is for us to be able to make sure that we don't miss this part, that God waited 12 months, continually speaking, if you will, to King Nebuchadnezzar, Reminding him of Daniel and his words to him, just repent of your sin, King Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, he would not repent. And so let me say it again. Don't let the amazing grace and long-suffering of God have you thinking that if repentance is not near, that judgment will not eventually come. Because it has to. We serve a holy God. Well, verse 31, he goes on to give us the consequences of disobedience. He says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, 
A voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar. To you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like an ox, and then seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives to whoever he chooses. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like an oxen. His body was wet with dew from heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And so just as Daniel had interpreted the horror came to pass, and King Nebuchadnezzar for seven years was reduced to an animal as he ate grass of the field outside the palace. God gave the dream, and God gave the interpretation. And it's interesting, as you study history, even Babylonian historical records show that there were no decrees from the king for a seven-year period. King Nebuchadnezzar was sent to the fields as a animal exactly as God had interpreted through Daniel. Family, the point is that we're looking at a man that could have humbled himself. He could have asked for forgiveness from the Lord and we'd be reading a different story this morning. But he remained prideful and God humbled King Nebuchadnezzar in a big way. In 1 Peter in chapter 5, the Bible says this. It says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. May we take away from the truth of Scripture this morning that if we don't humble ourselves before the Lord, he certainly will bring the humbling. In verse 34 it says, At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And so recognize with me that King Nebuchadnezzar finally realizes that our God is the one that reigns. And that our God restored King Nebuchadnezzar as he humbled himself before Almighty God and his, sanct his sanctity was given back to him. Wow. How I can relate to this story. Because some 32 years ago, I was out of my mind. And it wasn't until I received Jesus Christ for who he truly is that the Lord restored my mind, the Lord restored our marriage, and the re Lord restored my life. And I'm here this morning just to say to you that if your pride has allowed for you to to come to a place in your life where it's all messed up, let me remind you that our God is a God that fixes messes. If we'll just humble ourselves before the King of Kings, he will fix your mess, even as he did King Nebuchadnezzar and my own. Joel 2 and verse 25 says this, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent amongst you. Let me just tell you this morning, God will allow for all kinds of locusts, if you will, to come into your life if that's what it takes to get your attention, to be able to drive the pride out of your life and allow for you to be able to humble yourself and bow before the King of Kings and Lord of Lord. I want to be clear on this. Pride comes in many colors. It comes in many different ways. And this morning, 
Some of you might be too prideful in the past to allow for others to pray for you. Too prideful to be able to get out of your seat and to be able to walk to the front and have pastors lay hands on you, elders and their wives lay hands on you and to be able to pray for you. Too prideful to be able to say, I don't understand that passage. And to ask somebody to help you to be able to understand the scripture so that you might fall deeper in love with the Lord, allowing you to be more committed to him. Too prideful to be those that say, I don't know how to pray. Can you teach me how to pray? Can you help me to learn how to have communication with our holy God? Too prideful to be able to stand up and say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Please, will you pray for me? Don't allow for pride in what other color, whatever fashion that it presents itself to stop you from all that God wants for you to have. Let us finish in verse 35 to 37. The word says, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. Nebuchadnezzar coming to the place of acknowledging God. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom. And ex excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. And so we see that when King Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself before the Lord, well, then we find him. Isn't it a beautiful thing? As soon as he comes to the place acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he acknowledges the God of heaven, God Almighty is the one in charge. As soon as he comes to the place of knowing that it is he that gives kingdoms and takes them away, and bows before the Lord, his sanity is restored. And when sanity is restored, the king can't help but one thing, to praise and worship the king of kings, the Lord God Almighty in the heavens. May you and I learn from this passage that our rightful position before the Lord is praising and extolling and honoring the King of Heaven. Church, this morning, may we recognize that God wants only, only His very best for us. But His very best for us comes when we humble ourselves before Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Daniel. Thank you for the reminder, God, that our position is not to be one of pride and arrogance, but to be one of humility, to be one that, that understands and recognize that there is only one that we should bow before. To be those that recognize that this morning you are speaking very clearly to us about allowing pride to go. And humbling ourselves before you in reality of knowing who we are and who you are. And so this morning I pray for all those that have their eyes closed, their heads bowed, and if there's anyone here this morning that knows that you've just allowed pride to get in the way, you've allowed for pride to get in the way of your relationship with the Lord, allowed pride to get in the way 
of the kind of relationships that he wants you to have with others, then would you just stand up and allow for us to pray for you right now? Just stand up wherever you are and say, that's me, Pastor. I need prayer. I, I want prayer. And I'm not too prideful to ask for it. Just stand up wherever you are and just say to the Lord, God, I need you to take this as we cry out to him. He says that if any of us would pray according to his name, that is, according to his will, that it should be granted to us. And ridding ourselves of pride is certainly according to his will. And so allow for us to bow before him right now our hearts as we pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. And thank you for your word. You're an awesome God. And, and we come before you acknowledging, Lord, that we know who we are. We're sinners, God, in need of you, Jesus, our Savior. Would you forgive us of our sins? Would you come, Lord, and help remove, root out, God, the pride that is us. Lord, with all of us that are standing, may you, as I stand with these, help me to be able to let go and give way to you, helping me to understand your heart, to be more like you. God, to have compassion, even as we see Daniel having compassion for King Nebuchadnezzar, for those that are lost, for those that are backslidden. God, may we have compassion. And Lord, may we be those that are bold and ready to stand in the truth, not cowered down from anyone that is around us. And allow for the pride to go away so that we can deliver that truth in humility. And allow for you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to do the work that only you can do. God, we're standing and we know that there are times when pride not only has gotten in the way of our relationship with you, but in relationship with others. So we ask you this morning, help us. Allow us to humble ourselves, Lord. Sometimes we can be right in what we are are disagreeing about, but we can be wrong in the manner in which we're presenting it. God, help us to be those that humble ourselves. Even to ask forgiveness from those that we've offended. Lord, to be those that recognize that it is only in us coming to that place of humility that your smile is back on your face. As you look down at your children this morning, Lord, may you smile as we say we know who we are. And we're asking you, a holy God, to help us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.